Hello, hello. You have to have your own picture of testing, testing. Hello, hello, hello. Actually, let's make a video. Hello, Rochelle White. Good evening. How are you? Shake me Fatima. Good evening. Don't worry, Dr. Sunday is coming in a minute. I just need to give my announcements first. Hello, welcome. As you're coming in, please start to share. Wellington, good evening. How are you? Dr. Sunday is going to be here shortly. I just want to do my announcements. And before I do, I would prefer if more people are in. So please, guys, share, share, share. Hello, Innocent. Dr. Sunday is coming shortly. For those of you that are just coming in, just to let you know, Dr. Sunday is going to be here in a moment. Omonike, good evening. Good evening, good evening. Jane, good evening, how are you? Okay, I can say the statement now and repeat it again when it's back or later on. So the statement is about the movement. Guys, I hope some of you have seen the page that was set up, um, the movement against deception in the church. Movement against deception in the church. So please like that page, that's the page that we're going to be on and sharing our um, this how our understanding of or the truth that we've learned from um, the scriptures and what Dr. Sunday's teachings is all about, and also what's happening in the church. You can see I posted a video on that today. So those type of videos, if you see any church or anyone like that, we would uh, share those things. So that we can just show people what the deceptions look like. This is not an expose. It's just to show what it looks like. Because sometimes we don't know what it looks like. We don't know what these deceptions are. And we just keep getting deeper and deeper in them. So because I, I was in a church where I was seeing this, this type of deception. But I didn't know that it was deception. Until I was given um, the truth. So guys, that's why we have this page. Also, we have two categories of people for the pay, uh, for the new movement, not for the pay, for the new movement. We have ambassadors, which Dr. Sunday announced yesterday. He would like 300 ambassadors. And then, if you're interested in joining as an ambassador, write, I am in. If you're interested in the second category of people who are the committees, the committees, what they'll be doing is that they will be making decisions about the new movement what we're going to do, how we're going to do this movement, the direction, the what, when, where. So if you're interested in being a committee member, then just write committee or com with double M. I will know that it is. So I can extract your name and then contact you regarding the movement. So thank you so much, everyone. So do, do, I will repeat the movement information again. First of all, we have two categories of people, ambassadors. Ambassador, everyone can be an ambassador. We can all be an ambassador. Um, the other category is the committee members. Committee members are people that are willing to do the nitty gritty of making decisions and also be an ambassador. So a committee member will have a door role, whereas an ambassador would just focus on being an ambassador for the movement against deception in the church. We need to stop this. We spoke about it extensively over the last few weeks a uh, few weeks two weeks now this is the second week and we want to do something about it we just don't want to talk we want to take action so guys please feel free to join the movement yes innocent thank you for the comments i can see your thumbs up thank you very much darling good evening how are you are you all good evening for those of you that are just coming in dr sunday is coming shortly it's in a meeting just next door so it would be with us in a few minutes. So in the meantime, rather than just leave the floor open, I thought I'll give the announcement. Uh, Somebody is asking for volume. I will try and put the volume up as much as I can. Dr. Sunday is here, so I would move, okay? Hello, hello, hello everyone. Sorry, please, for my delay. I was having another conference call. <laughs> I was having another conference call today in the 
with America, so sorry for that. That was actually being interviewed. <laughs> okay, welcome everyone. We are continuing the subject, the prostitution of Titan offering. And uh, today we are going to examine <laughs> Uh, the Zarephath woman uh, as the Zarephath widow actually uh, I think the window is uh, open somewhere Can we yeah. mm -hmm. the Zarephath uh, widow so we are going to be examining that because um, a lot of false doctrines have entered into the church just because of this poor woman uh, but the woman is not to blame i tell you it is the preachers of the gospel that have corrupted everything and have converted everything to money it has to be about money it has to be about money if it's not about money it's not worth preaching about it has to be about money everything now is about money if it's not about money it's not interesting let me tell you my story about the Zera, uh, Zera, Fa, Zera Fa, um, uh, widow. Uh, the, I knew that scripture, of course, you know, like uh, any Bible student would know about that woman. But I discovered her, I discovered her in a new way, uh, in a very unique and a very funny way. So uh, the uh, Zarefa woman became a totally different story to me after one minister from Nigeria uh, actually two ministers from Nigeria came to see me to visit me here in Ukraine they came to you know to you know, they, they visited Ukraine and uh, then they came to my church and they said how, how come you have at that point maybe we had a few thousand people in the church and um, I, I was living in a one bedroom apartment and I didn't even have a car because we only had less than 2,000 people in the church this time and so uh, these uh, people, these uh, believers uh, were telling me, these pastors were telling me how come you have 2,000 people in your church and you don't have a car? <laughs> it's an insult, it's a disgrace How come you have such a big crowd? Such a huge crowd? How can you have such a huge crowd and you don't have a car? And you don't have a house? And you don't have an apartment? You are even renting? How can... It's not possible. How can... You know, it's not possible. Let, let's help you. Let's help you. We have to help you. You know, you, so they started telling me of the churches that they attended. And at that point, I've been out of Nigeria for years. I've just been here. And uh, they started telling me of how pastors in Nigeria do it. Hmm. The volume is low. It's not supposed to be low. It's supposed to be high. Because I'm really talking loud here. So they, they started talking to me about how Nigerian pastors and the big churches. So they started mentioning the big churches and how these big churches actually rake in money uh they are the raking money uh thanks to the right interpretation according to them the right interpretation of the bible that was when they, they said they were going to show me a few scriptures that who that are money making scriptures money making scriptures scriptures that will yield that will bring money to me and bring money to make me to have money more money than i could imagine and that uh, you, uh, you cannot have this kind of church and this kind of crowd without having, uh, without, uh, without having a lot of money. So, uh, so these people started showing me scriptures. Scriptures that are supposed to be money-making scriptures. Scriptures that are supposed to be bringing in money to me and making me to have money more than I could imagine. One of the first things they told me is that even without scripture, before I would go into the scripture, the very first money-making strategy they gave me is that we have been coming to your church now, we have been following you to the church now for two weeks, and in all these two weeks, we see that you only collect offering 
on Sunday service. In Sunday services, because that time I was only doing offering, you know, Sunday and Thursday, and, and uh, the midweek service. So two times a week. How come? How? But I was having ten services a week. I was having ten services a week because many sometimes several services a day. I was having ten services a, a week, but I was only having two offerings in a in a in a in a week. So they say, how could you be coming? You know, you have church two services on Sunday, then you have uh, every service on Monday. You have leaders meeting. You have this. You have this. You have this. All those services they must be with uh, with offering. Where is your offering back? I said we don't even bring them. Ah. Anytime church member gather, it is of opportunity not to make money now. You don't know. Anytime that you, you have to, even, even if you don't have program, you have to set up program every day. You have to make sure that you have services morning and afternoon or day, at least every day. And the reason is not because of the service. Oh, it's just for you to be able to make money, to be able to call for offering. Service is for offering now. How can you gather together and you not have offering? A service is for offering. You must do offering. You must do. You must give a word for offering. You must uh, do you no know, tight an offering. You must give tight. You must call for offering every every meeting. That is when I mean that is the whole idea. How will you pay for this? How will you? Pay? That's why you don't have a car. That's why you don't have a house. That's why you don't have anything. And you have thousands of white people. Ah, hey, this kind of congregation that you are, everybody is dreaming of it in Nigeria. This will have two thousand white people, and this, you are only two years as a church that time. How can you have 2,000? And everybody is dreaming. Even the ones who are having 10,000 in Nigeria, they are ready to change with you. They will take 2,000, 1,000, say, for white people and give, they will give the African to you. But because, but you, you have to make, know how to take money from them. How to, you know, a church is supposed to be bringing you too much money. With 2,000 people in your church, white people, you are supposed to have money just everywhere. Fly. In fact, you are supposed to have your private jet. <laughs> These are the things pastors talk about. These are the rubbish pastors talk about. So after talking about, you know, using the strategy of having meeting every day and you must have offering for, for each service, then they went ahead and said, let's now show you the scriptures. So one of the scriptures they showed me is the scripture where Jesus said, uh, send the whatever donkey, you know, go and take, the, send the disciples to go and uh, untie the donkey and bring the donkey to him. So they said, but you see, they, so they were trying to, because I was arguing with them, that how can you be manipulating? They said, but you see Jesus, they, they were telling me the apostles, and I mean the bishop in Nigeria, the big bishop that were using, that taught them that in pastor's meetings, that they were taught in their pastor's meetings, in their pastor's seminar or pastor's meeting they did in Nigeria, they were taught by this big bishop that uh, you know, Jesus didn't say go and take permission. Jesus just said go and beg, beg, go and just bring the thing that I need. So, as a man of God, you know, you could just use many people, members of the church, and you tell them they are the ones, they are the donkey to bring in all the money that you need. So they were convincing me that Jesus just said go and take it, go and go and bring it. And if anybody asks you, nobody should quarrel you. Say I am in need of it. The Lord is in need of it. So the same thing, all the members you have, they, it's through them that the blessing will come to you. It is through them that the blessing will come to the church. It is through them that all the money that you need should come. So these are the kind of, and the pastors, the African pastors were convincing me that, you know, I shouldn't have problem with money because it's because I didn't understand the Bible very well. And that, so I said, but when I was in Nigeria, uh, there was no, there, nobody was, because I got saved in, in deeper life and I was only going to church for six months in Nigeria but it's ah the, the churches in Nigeria they started showing me all kind of bishops all kind of new buildings all kind of new bishops new movements they say ah yeah those 80s you were saved in the 80s ah those are the issues issues nobody can issues <laughs> forget now Christianity eh <laughs> it is prosperity is the thing prosperity so they were telling me those who are just ah, those are just ignorant days. Those are just old-fashioned Christians, deeper life. Nobody even knows them anymore. They are forgotten. They are dead. They are buried. The ones that are reigning now are the ones that promise people about money. 
So they started telling, they showed one of the, they showed me many scriptures, but let me show you the one that was when they now told me about first king. They said, do you know the, the story of the widow? I said, which widow? They said, the widow in the Old Testament, uh, the Elijah widow. So they said, and they, know the, they knew the name. I knew the name, but I didn't know it. Or I couldn't pronounce it. They said, oh, Zarephath, Zarephath, Zarephath widow, Zarephath widow, ah. That is one of the most money-making scriptures. Zarephath widow, ah! That is how your needs will be met. All your needs as a pastor will be met. All your needs should be taken care of just from that one scripture. Zarephath, Zarephath widow is the key to sustain you. So they were convincing me That that scripture, I knew the scripture, but I was looking at my own understanding of that scripture was that God was trying to tell us that he's able to resolve any problem. And that he's a miracle working God and that he will give people the instruction to meet your needs when necessary. So I knew that God used that woman to meet the need of Elijah, but I knew that it was under his concrete instruction. That is, but they said, no, it's not, it's, but well, that is the, the word of God now. Are you not a minister too? Are you not a prophet? Are you not a servant of God? Hey, hey. So it is not just, so they are taking it as a doctrine. So it is like, I'm looking at it as just an exceptional situation, a scenario, just a case, a case study, just, you know, just one incident, just one incident that you, you know, just, just one event that happened. But they are saying, no, it is, a, it is a rule. That is how you should be using it to preach to your people. And there is no anybody that is in your church must be, be the one to provide for you. You must never be in need of anything. If you need a car, just go to the church and tell somebody who has a car and tell them that uh, you see the wo woman. And they said it works. And the whole argument they were having is that it works. When people give the car like that to the pastor, they go and sold it to the pastor that they will just come back. Less than one year, they will come back with testimony that God has blessed them with some new cars. You don't have a house, no problem. They just go and use that scripture and say, you see, this woman gave the last bread and it, it got, you know, God took care of, it, of her. So the same thing, if you don't have car, just go out and tell them that if you will give your car, to the man of God and saw it that God will take care of you too. So they said that is the key to abundance, to, abo to prosperity. You should never be in need. You should never be praying for money again. That How many members do you have? I said, you see, 2,000. Okay, let's say 2,000. 2,000, one will bring fridge. One will bring uh, air conditioner. One will bring uh, car. One will bring house. Some people will even bring, even play itself. Some people will even bring anything you would never even imagine. When you preach this message, eh, if you want, we can preach it for you. We we'll preach it very well. These are these are pastors from Nigeria coming here to Russia to teach me how to do ministry and how to have money. So this is my own. I'm just telling you the story of my introduction to this passage. This is my own introduction. To this passage and people have used this passage to rape the church of the Lord Jesus Christ people have used this passage to rape the church people have used this passage to exploit the believers people these pastors especially are now viewing and looking at this passage as a money-making scripture. There are many like that, many scriptures like that, they call money-making scripture. Another scripture is where it says that those people who serve in the, in the church, who serve in the church or who serve you, that they should be given double honor. But he didn't mention money there, but for Christian, for pastors today who are money-centered and money-focused pastors, double honor means only money. It didn't say or money at all. Or honor, in talking about respect, dignity, honor, but it is money, double honor. You must be giving, anybody that serves you in the world, you must give him double honor. So it means double money, bring money. 
It must double whatever you have there. So these are rogues and scammers that we call our fathers in the Lord. I'm sorry. A lot of these people are people that you people call fathers in the Lord, fathers in the Lord, fathers in the Lord. And all these fathers in the Lord have allowed these scriptures, have allowed this passage, have allowed this kind of doctrine to pollute the church. And many people are now, all the churches, all, I don't even know any church in Nigeria that doesn't preach this. But let us go to the truth of the word of God. Let us go to that scripture and see the truth for ourselves, okay? So, the topic of today is, are we supposed to give to men of God? like the Zarephath woman, like the Zarephath widow gave to Elijah. Are we supposed to be giving like that today, our last? Are we supposed to be giving our last to the men of God because they are men of God? Even if we are poor as the widow. Let's go to that scripture. It's in 1 Kings 17. 1 Kings 17, 11 to 16. First Kings 17, 11 to 16. The scripture says, And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread. Only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. So he had, she had not prepared the bread yet. She only had the material to prepare the bread. She was on her way to prepare the bread. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat and die. Because at this time, there was prophecy that there was going to be famine and there was famine in the land. And this is the same man, Elijah, that God used to bring that famine on the land. So this woman was with the last piece of uh, bread or, you know, um, flour to make bread. And then she was, she didn't have any hope to survive after that. And then Elijah said to her, do not fear, do not fear, do not fear. You see, the interest, that the, the number one interest that was being taken care of here, in fact, the whole reason why God sent Elijah to this woman in the first place was for her interest and for her own protection. It was, think, it was all up thinking about her because she was going to eat that last bread with her son and the two of them were going to die. So God was actually taking that decision for their own good, for their interest. God was thinking about them. God was putting them ahead in, the, in his own priority. So that's why Elijah could tell her confidently and say, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first. Make me a small cake from the bread first. Not give me the bread, not make the bread for me, just a small cake from that flour, and you still go ahead and make bread for yourself or your, or your son. He said, make me a small cake, just a small cake for me first, and bring it to me, and afterward, make some more, afterward, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel. So he didn't take. So this is the first deception in this in people's interpretation of this passage. When you hear preachers talk about the uh, Zarephine, uh, the Zaref Zarephine woman, Zarephite woman, they always tell you that she gave the last that she had. But it's not true. See that scripture again. She never gave a last. She never gave the last thing she had. She never gave the whole thing she had. She never gave the last bread. And she never gave, gave even the last flour. She didn't give all that she had. She was asked only for a fragment of it. For a little portion of it. 
So that doctrine where they are telling you that give everything, go and sacrifice everything, go and sell everything, go and sell your car, your television set, go and give everything in your pocket, go give everything, is a false doctrine. Because this is not talking about giving everything. This is talking about a small portion of the thing that they had left. He said, said, do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But make me a small cake first from it. And bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel... The bean of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many more days to come. The bean of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry. So you see now, let me point out to you some of the things here. Number one, the, the widow didn't give her last. So whenever a pastor comes to you and says, make sacrifice, uh, a prophet offering, or you know, make sacrifice and uh, just give your last, and God knows, God will bring to you like the Zarephath woman. No, that is a crook right there. That's an arm robber in the pulpit. And it, it's just a crook and a scammer and a 419 that wants to rob you of your last money. So the widow didn't give her last. Number two, she had enough left for her and for her son. It was only a small portion that was given out to Elisha it, it, to test her faith. To test her readiness to part with little. So her faith, since she had that faith, just by a little, God was ready to bless her. It was all about blessing her. It's not just all about the man of God. It was not all about Elijah. It was all about saving this family. Secondly, the next thing you want to notice is Elijah did not go to ask for that bread. He did not even go to that woman by his own accord. Elijah did not go to, uh, to ask for need by himself. Yeah, Elijah didn't even know the address of this woman. Elijah didn't even know that this woman existed. And that Elijah didn't even have any idea about the, the, that the existence of this woman. So Elijah was not motivated by greed. Elijah was not motivated by self-driven self purposes. Elijah was not motivated by, by, by selfishness or greed at all or egocentrism. Elijah didn't have this woman in, a, in, a, in his plan or in his mind. Elijah didn't make any calculations about this woman because he didn't even know that she existed. It was a divine instruction given to Elijah to go to her. God had to give the Elijah the address and had to lead her to this woman. So it is not something that we should just randomly practice. This is not something that we should just come to church and say, there are 1,000 people here that have $1,000 each. Or there are 10 people here that are able to give 1,000. Or there are 100 people here that will give 1,000. You should never do such a crazy thing. If you do that, you are just a scammer and a manipulator. So this is not what we are supposed to be. We are supposed to be doing just at will. If you do that, you are taking advantage of people. If you do that, you are just exploiting God's children. Elijah was giving specific instruction. Elijah was led by God himself to this woman. It was not that she just went to any random person. Even Jesus spoke about this case and said that there were many women in Israel there were many widows in Israel and in Samaria when God sent Elijah to this Sarafat woman. God sent Elijah to this particular concrete woman because of what he wanted to do in her life. But to take this scripture and now be using it as a whole doctrine to be telling people to give their last, it just it means that you have the love of money. You are addicted to mammon. 
and then you are addicted to money. You are selfish and you are taking advantage of the children of God. And that is what churches have been doing these days. This should never have been a doctrine at all. See what it says in uh, First uh, King chapter 17 verse 9. It says, God told Jeremiah, uh, uh, Elijah, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belonged to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded the widow there to provide for you. I have commanded. Another thing you have to take note is that God had given notice about the coming of Elijah to the woman. God had informed the woman that Elijah was coming. God had prepared the woman for this. So it's not just that say it was Elijah, it was the prophet God spoke to and God never spoke to Elijah. No, God has spoken to the, I mean, God has not just spoken to Elijah the prophet and didn't speak to the woman. No, God spoke to Elijah and God took his time to speak to the woman as well. Not to Elijah. So all these crooks that are coming to be the ones, they are the prophet, they are the ones who want to take your money and they are your prophet. They are the ones who are can you come here, uh, Pastor? No, let Mrs. Uh, Shorun can come. So it, it, is, it is manipulative when it is the men of God themselves who are coming to the church and I'm telling you, God said you should give to me or God said you should bring offering to, to the church and they are the ones to take it. You know, it's a conflict of interest. But here there was no conflict of interest. There was no conflict of interest in the sense that God had gone to the widow, and see what the Bible says here. You know, you don't believe me. See it. It says here in First Corinthians, I mean First King 17 9. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belonged to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. God had commanded the widow to provide. I have commanded the widow to provide for you. God spoke to the widow and said, there is somebody coming, my servant, the prophet, you provide for him. Give to him what you have. So it's not that I am the prophet that needs the body and I'm the same one that is coming to tell you, uh, God said you have a bank account and your bank account, I can see now, Holy Spirit is telling me in the name of Jesus, wow, ooh, my eyes just opened and your account number is 002222. And that, one, and that account number, you have $10,000 there. God said, bring it now. Bring it now so that you will not die or so that something will happen. That is rubbish. It is just, you know, you know it's just witchcraft. It's, it's familiar spirit. If anybody is telling you by your, your account number, if you did not give your account number to anybody and they are telling you that you don't know how they got it, it is called familiar spirit. It is not revelational. It is not prophet. It is familiar spirit. It is unclean, familiar spirit that is giving them your account number, that is giving them information about your village, that is giving them your home number, that is giving them your car number. It is a familiar spirit outright there. It is the same kind of familiar spirit that we saw in the Acts of the Apostles when the apostles came to, to the city and the, you know, the woman, that, I mean the young girl, 16 year old girl, was saying, oh we know you, you are servant of the most high God. You know, and Paul, I mean Peter, I mean, Paul, Paul, Paul had to cast out that demon from him because it is an information that is not beneficial to her right now. What is your own problem with that? We know who we are. So why are you coming to us with that? You know your account number. Why should anybody be getting revelation to tell you about your own account number? You know your own address, home address. Why should anybody be coming with revelation to tell you about your own address? Why should anybody be coming to tell you about your plate number? You know your own plate number. It is all familiar spirit. So if anybody comes across you or to your church telling you all those kind of rubbish, just know that they are addicted to money. And that addiction to money has allowed them to be possessed by a familiar spirit. And they are all thinking that is the spirit of God. And they probably believe it. That is the spirit of God that is walking through them. They think it is still God. But right, they don't know that in the spirit realm, it's not just God that is there. It's not just God alone that is there. It's even familiar spirit that is there. And in this case, it is if any spirit that is calling for money, any spirit that is seeing money in your pocket, any spirit that is telling you to bring to me, if I'm the same prophet and I'm saying God is saying bring to me and give me, and God didn't tell you before, you know that that is a familiar spirit of greed. 
That is a spirit of greed. It's a spirit of mammon. If it is God, let that prophet talk back to God and say, God, go speak to him or go speak to Ao. In this case, God said he has spoken to the woman. And that is on what basis that Elijah had, that is the authority that Elijah had to go now and approach the woman. God had already cleared the way. God had already spoken to the woman. God had already prepared her heart. God had already warned her. That is why she now could obey. And that is why even the prophet had the boldness to go and ask the woman for the money. I mean, for the, for the, for the, for the food. Uh, but even, he didn't, even then, even though God spoke to her, to the woman and to the man, he still didn't ask for everything. He still didn't take everything from her. He just took a little bit, uh, you know, that, you know, as a sign. As a sign of obedience, as a sign of conformity with her Messiah, and which God later used as a as a as, as a blessing and bless her and, and her whole household. Thank you, man. Let me tell you another thing from that scripture. So notice that God had earlier instructed the widow ahead of time to feed the to the prophet. Alright? So God has to speak to you. If God didn't speak to you earlier on. If if he if he's just telling if the only the preacher or assistant pastor or the pastor or the host pastor that is just coming out, come forward, raise your hand. Ten people here, hundred people here, one thousand here, one thousand dollars. Ten people have, have one thousand uh, dollars. You know, uh, you have to give give. And God has just spoken to, to me. He will bless you. It's just manipulation. It is all manipulation. Oh, when I was in uh, California. God told, told me that you know, there is going to be 10 people here and next year I came back, one woman came and just stories. If God can do all those miracles, eh? if God has done it in California, in Arizona, you know, why can't can God do it for you? Why should you need to collect my own? Are you not, you are talking to God free of charge like that, I mean, openly. If you can talk to God openly like that, God can talk to you directly that there are 10 people here. Why should it be from here? Why can't you just, why can't God do the same miracle to give it to you on his own? Why do you need me for God to give you if God himself is the one who is giving you? Why can't the God that is able to tell you that there are 10 people here, the God that is able to tell you my account, bank account, the God that is able to tell you my own number, why can't that God provide for you by yourself, one-on-one, -on -one, directly, without me? Why do you think me if you have direct contact with God like that? How can you have faith in God to hear him? How can you have faith in God to, you know, to get all this revelation about me? And you are not getting about yourself. Let God tell you now where you will get your, where the money is for you to go and make it and take it by yourself. Why can, do you need me? If you are so close to God and if God has spoken to you and God can talk to you like that, why do you need me? Why do you need us? Why do you need to take my own money? Let God give you his own money, your, your own money, the way he gave me my own money now. Your, I got my own money somewhere, or somehow, and you two go and get your own money now, especially since you know God. You are the man of God. And these same men of God will preach to you and tell you to believe God and sow to them. Because if you will sow to them, you, God will bless whatever you give to them. And why can't they use the same principle? Let them too go and take money from their own money they already have. Let them go and sow it to me. Come and sow it to me. Oh. Come sow to your church members. Come sow to people in church. Come sow to me now. If you sow to me, I go and wait for your own blessing too. Why should I be the one to be sowing to you? And be then go, home, go home and be waiting. That maybe God will come there. God has to fulfill his promise. Why is it not you waiting for God to fulfill his promise to you? Are you not the man of God? You are closer to him now. So you should be able to agree with him one way or the other. For, for him to provide for you. If, you know, I, I don't know if you are getting my logic. Yeah. You know, the logic is that if you say, you know, they should bring, you know, God, God is God. And you are a servant of God. And God has told you this. God has told you that, you know, people should bring. There are 10 people here. Why should you gather us here to gather like that? Why can't God just provide for you? Is he not God? Are you not his friend? Are you not his servant? Or why don't you use the same principle you are telling me to use now? Now you are telling me to sow into you or to sow into the church. You two also go and sow into the church now. And then wait. Let God bring the blessing to you. 
Or go and look for people who are in need, like me, I'm in need. Everybody is in need. There is no problem to find people who are in need. Hey, you have some money, go and sell your own house. Go and sell your church. Go and sell your building. Go and sell something you have. And go and distribute the money to everybody. Let God bless you directly, without me. They are not using their, 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 their common sense. And even the people they are deceiving are also not using their common sense. And all these church members are just believing them gullibly. And we are just gullible. We are just, just gullible. Because we don't question anything. We have devoid our sense of critical thinking. We have devoid our sense of the art of thinking even. We don't even think. We don't analyze. We don't. That's why I did that teaching, that whole series on the art of thinking. If you have not listened to that to those series, go to my YouTube page. Go to the first page and you'll follow the series. One of the last series I did is called The Art of Thinking or Thinking, Analytical Thinking. Go look for it and let's begin to think. And they are taking advantage of you because you don't think. So next thing that I want to I want to point out from that scripture in 1 Kings 17, 11 to 16, is that notice that the, the, the word that the prophet spoke, he said, the bean of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So, and God kept that word immediately from that very same day, the word of the real prophet came to pass. God kept the word that is, and all these people that are telling us, go bring this offering, go bring that offering, God will do it. Why should it be, you know, sometime God will do it. If God is the one talking through, let him do it right now. Let him do it right now. Let God do it right now. Let God, are you not using the example of Zarephath woman? And what, what, the miracle that happened there is that God confirmed this word. But most of these prophets and these men of God, God cannot confirm their word because it is not God's word. God is only obliged to confirm his own word, the real revelation that comes from him. But all these revelations that men are giving, it is their own word. And it is between you. You are, you are on your own. If you follow their, pro their prophecies, if you follow their revelations, that there are 10 people here, 12 people here, $1,000 there, $1,000 it is between you and it is you are on your own, no? God is not doesn't have any business in this. God is just washing his hand and saying, I'm not here. I'm they are just exploiting the name of God. These people are just exploiting the name of God. Because if it is God, God will show up immediately. God will confirm his word immediately. How many times have you given and nothing has happened? So that's just for you to know that you have been you have been you have been you have been uh uh tricked, you have been robbed, you have been um you know, you have been abused, you have been taken advantage of, you have been duped. You have been duped. How many times have you given special offering? How many times have you given prophet offering? How many times have you given all kinds of offering? And they have promised you that this will happen, that will happen. If it has not happened, you have just been duped. And you have been duped because you didn't think. And because you also want something for nothing. So, they are taking advantage of you. Anybody that wants to get something and is saying God is powerful, why should I first of all give something to you? Let me give to God now in my own way. So if you want to say, okay, there are 10 people here that have 10,000 or 1,000 each, God says you should give it to him, to God. Hey, is it not God? Did God, didn't God say I should give it to him? So why should I put it in the church? Why should I put it in your own pocket? Why should I put it here in your own, you know, offering? If God said I should give it to him, I know God, everybody belongs to God now. The poor that is in the street, it belongs to God. God said, I was poor. I mean, I was hungry and you fed me. So if God said, I, there are 10 people here that won't have $1,000. I have $1,000. I'm going to look for the ones who are hungry. Because God didn't say, I was in the church and you gave to me. And you know, he, then, he said, no, I was hungry. God is in the hungry. Jesus is not in the church. Most of those churches that you think you are going to, Jesus is not there. God has lived, left the place a long time ago. In fact, God is not even near there. But God said he is in the poor. 
He said, I was, I was the one who was, who, was, who was hungry. I am the one. You didn't feed me. I was the one who was hungry. I was the one who was naked. I was the one who was in the hospital. I was the one who was in the prison. Jesus is in that place. So if you say God gave you revelation that I should give 1,000, I will go and give it to where Jesus is. Where can I find Jesus? Where is God? Jesus in the flesh. Jesus is in the flesh. He is in the hungry. Jesus in the flesh. He is in the naked. Jesus in the flesh he is in the poor and the wretched and the and the and the and the uh, rejected and the out, 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 the outcast and everything. That is where Jesus is. So let me take my money and give there. But you know, once you tell them that, they will say, ah, no, 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 ah, 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 ah. no, 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 ah, ah. don't go. They will go. Ah. God is, is here. God is, is only here. They will begin to pull you to come and put only in them. Why should God only say I should give to you alone? No, you must. <laughs> As if they are God. But God didn't say, I am in the pastor, or I'm in the preacher, or I'm in the church. He said, I am in the poor, in the, in, the, in, the, in the naked, in the hungry. That is where God is. So if you want to give your tithe and offering to somebody, that is where you should take your tithe and offering to. Because God is not taking from the widows to give to the pastors. No, that is anti-principle anti of, of, of Christ. Let's look at, let's go to, because yesterday somebody was saying, I read one comment, one guy who, 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 is come, who has been following me, uh, you know, he was not bold enough to write what he was thinking on my own platform here. So I think Ush, uh, it was Ushe that wrote my quote. So he went to Ushe's platform and, and wrote that uh, to give tight to poor and the hungry, is, a, is an abomination and it's a false doctrine and he was here he didn't write anything he was not bold enough to write anything but he went and wrote there that uh what i teach is an abomination and it's a false doctrine okay let's see put false doctrine now as if I'm the, I, I'm the one who wrote it so let's go everybody to malachi chapter three let's go everybody to malachi that same malachi that they have used to wash your eyes that same Malachi that, that they have used to blindfold you. That same Malachi chapter 3. That same chapter 7. That they have used to manipulate you. And taking all the money from you. That same Malachi that they have used to oppress you. To, to run you dry and empty. It is that same Malachi that I want to take you to today. Yeah, and I've, show, and I've said it. I have said it when I spoke about Malachi. But some people don't hear. Let's go to Malachi. But only don't go to their... They are favorite scriptures, so don't go immediately. Because that chapter 3 doesn't start from verse 8. That chapter 3 in Malachi doesn't start from chapter 8 or 9 or 10 or 12. No, that scripture started, it's God started talking about it. It starts from verse 1. But the reason why chapter, the reason why chapter 8 came, and the reason, I mean verse 8, the reason why God spoke about verse 8, the reason why he spoke about verse 9, the reason why he spoke about verse 10 is it was started in verse 5. The beginning of that scripture was verse 5. And the reason was that God was worried and troubled and angry at the fact that priests and the leaders of the country, the leaders of the nation, and the, that's why he said you have been caused, the whole nation. The whole nation. It's not we members who are caused. It is the priest, the old leadership of the church and the priest, they have been caused because they have not collected money for the people he wants us to collect it for. He wants us to collect money. Come and see. Let's see the, the passage. What led to that Malachi 3, 8? It started in verse 4. So let's read verse 4. It says, and God is talking now in Malachi 3. This same Malachi that you are all talking about. This same Malachi chapter 3. But only read a little bit before. Verse 8, verse 5 says, and I will come near you to judgment. So who is he judging? He's not judging you, Christians. The cause that they are talking about, that cause is the, you didn't bring tithe you because he's not talking about you, members of church, 
to, that, that will be caused. He's talking about the leadership. He's talking about the priests. He's talking about the leadership of the country that are not bringing tithes, collecting tithes from the people to take care of the people that hurt, to take care of the people that where Jesus lives in. And Jesus, you know, we already know that from New Testament that Jesus lives in the poor. He lives in the in the in the hungry, in the blind, in the hospital, in the wretched. And it has always been like that. All throughout the Old Testament, God has always been saying, take care of the fatherless, take care of the widows, take care of the strangers, take care of all disenfranchised people. So because they were not doing that, God said, cause I view because you are not doing what I instructed you to do. It's not because you are not bringing tithe. It's because they are not using tithe for the right purpose. They are not collecting it to do the work that God has called them to do, to take care of the ordinary people. And that's what it says here in verse 5. I will come near to you to judge you. So who is he judging? Is it Christians? Is it believers? Is it the people? No. He said, I will be a sweet witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers, against the false wearers, and against those that oppress in, in, in their wages. Anybody that so, in their wages. Then he says, he will defend, he will come to judge. And to give judgment and justice to those who are oppressed, to the widow, to the fatherless, to the strangers. And he will judge all those people that turn aside, that turn aside from the strangers, that turn aside from the widow, that turn away from the widows, that turn their eyes away, that did not give to the widows, to the strangers, to the fatherless. So what he's talking about here is that the people, the leadership of the church, because the priest is not even here. God is saying he's coming to judge them because they are not taking care of the widows. They are not collecting tithes and offering. So this is where he started from. God needed justice for the widows. God was asking for justice for the uh, fatherless. God was asking for justice for the strangers. And so he said, you, where have you taken? You have robbed me because you are robbing these people. You are robbing me. More like what Jesus said. You have robbed me. You have not fed me. You have, because you have not fed these people, you have not fed me. You have not clothed me because you have not clothed these people. The same thing he was saying here. You have not defended the, 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 the helpless. You have not defended the oppressed. You have not, you know, given to the, to the widow. You have not given to the fatherless. So, cursed are you because the tithe and offering that I designated to be, to be used to take care of these people, you are not even using it to take care of them. You are using it anyhow you want. So, this all chapter 3 of Malachi is talking about people collecting tithe and offering to use it to take care of the oppressed, of the widows, of the fatherless. So, we are not supposed to be taking money from the widows. We are supposed to be providing for widows. And that is what we saw in that uh, Zarephath story. In the Zarephath story, it, it, it was God not taking away from the widow, but actually providing for the widow. God was providing and taking care of the widow. And that has always been the, at the heart of God. God has always been about taking care of the strangers, the widows, the orphans, and the oppressed people in the world. And tithe and offering is to help take care of them. And that is why the other scriptures in the in 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 uh, in, Deuter in Deuteronomy I always read that scripture in Deuteronomy, and that's why the scripture in Deuteronomy twenty six verse twelve and thirteen says, "When thou hast made the end of thy tithing, all the tithe of thy increase should be given to the Levite, and only ten percent is given to the Levite. Ten percent of your tithe given to the Levite." But the rest, 90% of it, is supposed to be given to the stranger, to the fatherless, and to the widow. So tithe is not to, to, about to be you taken just to the church, but to be used to take care of the needy, of the needs of the widow and the fatherless. But today, the gospel that we preach is that the widow should go and sell everything she has. The widow should go and give her last. But that is not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is the one that's rather takes care of the widows and of the you no know, of the of the orphans the fatherless the strangers and all the oppressed people that's why he said i was the one who was hungry i was the one who was thirsty i was the one who was homeless i was the one 
He is the one. And tithe and offering is supposed to be collected to help them, to provide for them. And that's why God provided, you know, as soon as the, uh, the widow believed Elijah, God provided so much abundance for her. Because she would have died otherwise. She was not having what to eat the next day. But thanks to the fact that she, he came, he brought solution for her. He brought, so that is what pastors and men of God are supposed to be. We are supposed to be providing for our widows. We are supposed to be giving to our widows, not collecting from them. And not just from the widow, from the poor people in the church. And that's why when you read the book of Acts chapter 4, you will see that all the tithe and offering and everything that they collected, they were using it to distribute to all the members of the church in the Acts of the Apostles so that there was none of them that was in need of anything. They were not in need of anything because they understood this thing, that the whole purpose of the kingdom of God, the whole purpose of, of, of God and of, you know, of the church is to take care of the need, to meet the needs of the members and to meet the need of the world and to use our resources and our abundance to take care of the people who are in need no matter who they are. So this is what this whole thing is supposed to be about. But instead of us doing that, we are telling people they should give their last, they should sacrifice, they should give their, uh, you know, you know, their their offering and their last offering and their, you know, because of the uh, Zerophite widow. In Matthew 23, in Matthew 23 verse 14, let's see what Jesus says about this kind of people. In Matthew 23, verse 14, let's see what God says about it. But rather give alms of such things as you have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. But woe unto you, Pharisees, for you tithe. You see, God put alms, giving alms higher than tithe. Say, so give alms, take care of this about love. This is about the kingdom of love. Give alms of everything you have. Take care. Share anything you have. Everything you have, share with people. Give to people. People in need. I am the one you are giving to. But I said, but woe unto the pastors or the Pharisees. For you tight means and rule and all manner of herbs and pass over justice. So you just neglect justice and the love of God, you see. Justice and the love of God which are the weightier matters of the law? Again, this is Luke now. Luke chapter 11. 11 he's talking, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I was reading Luke. I, I, I told you Matthew, right? Yes. Matthew 23, 14. Let's read Matthew 23, 14 first. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses. <laughs> is it not the thing that is happening today? People are devouring the widows. People are robbing the widows. And it's not just the widows. Why is Jesus using the widow as an example here? As an example of disenfranchised person. As, a, as an example of somebody who is, you know, unfortunate. Someone who is, you know, disadvantaged. Someone who is in need. But pastors today are oppressing the needy. So Jesus is, has spoken about them right in the Bible. He said, woe to you. So that's like saying, curse unto you. Anybody that does that, that, because in the Old Testament, like I just read, Matthew, I mean, Deuteronomy 26, 12, it says that God, I mean, the Old Testament, the, you know, tithe and offering was never connect, collected from the widows. God didn't allow tithe and offering to be collected from widows. Tithe and offering was rather collected from people who are well to do and giving to the widows. And not just to the widows, but to the weak, to the to the disenfranchised people, to the disadvantaged people. And that's why he's cursing the, he's abusing and cursing the Pharisees here. That don't you know that even in the Old Testament, they, nothing was collected. They were not supposed to even give tithe. They were not supposed to even give offering. They, we, they were, you are supposed to collect offering and tithe for them. So he's saying, woe to you, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour. You are taking from the voir here. He's saying you are taking from the weak, from the widow's houses for a pretense and, and to compensate for that, you say you have an excuse. You make long prayers. 
Today is the same thing. So for the prayers of breakthrough. So for the prayer of anointing. So for your children. So for your this thing. For that and that. So he's saying you collect their money and then you make you cover it up by saying you are praying for them. You cover it up by making long prayers. Today people don't even make long prayers for them. They they make just short prayers and declaration. They just make prophetic declaration on them, but collect what they have. So Jesus said here, therefore, for doing this, you will receive greater condemnation. So for collecting money from the widows, for collecting money from the poor, for collecting money from the disenfranchised people, for collecting money from the disadvantaged people, God said every pastor, every leader that does that will receive greater condemnation. Because past, I mean, widows, you know, uh, orphans and all people that are disadvantaged, they are not supposed to be the ones you are taking from. They are supposed to be the ones you are giving to. That is Matthew 23, verse 14. Read your Bible. He said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. That's like, Woe to you, pastors and bishops. Hypocrites. Hypocrites. For you take away from widows, I would say. And make pretense to make long prayers for them. They say you will have greater condemnation. And many people have a lot of pretenses that they are using today. They pretend to say, oh, God has given you revelation, that them revelation that something is going to happen to you if you do so, you have to go and sow money. Oh, God has given them revelation that something is going to happen to your children, so they have to take your money. Oh, you know, we are building this and building that, so they have to take your money. Oh, is God has opened to us this new project, a university or a building campus, so they have to take your money. But the Bible says it is the widows and the disadvantaged people that we are not supposed to be taking from them, but giving to them. Then Luke 11, 41 to 42 said, but rather give arms of such things as ye have. God, rather give arms and behold all things are clean unto you you see when you give arms when you give to the, the widow to the you know, a disadvantage all things become clean to you tight also becomes clean offering becomes clean to you it is the word of jesus luke eleven forty one. when you give your tight and offering when you take care of the disadvantage when you give to the to the widow when you give arms all things become clean to you that is how much God cares about people we need. That is how much God elevates love. Love the poor. Love. That's why he said, you give to me. If you give to the hungry, you give to me. If you give to the naked, you give to me. If you give to the man in the hospital, you give to me. All things are clean to you when you do that. Then he goes ahead to say, but woe unto you Pharisees, for you tight, even though you tight. So, People who give, all, uh, who give alms to the weak, to the poor, everything is clean to them. God said, you are blessed, everything is clean to you, you are covered. But those who give tight, God said, woe to them. These ones are giving tight and they are receiving woe. Because they give all the tight, but they abandon justice, loving kindness. So it doesn't matter how much tight you give. If you are not taking care of the needy in your village, in your street, around you, if you are not taking uh, care of the, you know, uh, of the needy and the, the disadvantaged people, God is saying, woe unto you with all your tight. Your tight does not impress God. But today, as if our tight replaces everything. Rather, God said it is the arms that replaces everything. The arm to the poor, the mercy, the act of love for the poor and the disadvantaged people. That's why God told that man in Matthew and said, go and sell everything you have and don't go to, go, don't give tithe from it. He didn't say, okay, you go and sell all your tithe, all your properties, give tithe first and then the rest give to the poor. He didn't say go and give tithe. He said go and give everything to the poor without tithe. Without tithe, go give everything to the poor. Why? Because God rates arms caring for the poor. Loving the poor, giving to the needy, God raised it higher than the raised tight in the New Testament. Even in the Old Testament. By the way, if you have not yet shared this message, please let us stop right now and go and look at the 
under the video, you will see the share button. Let's go and share. Look for the share button and let's go share these messages right now because I think I'm feeling that a lot of people will need this message. So we'll go and look for the share button and let's go quickly go and share. Let's go quickly go and share this message. So pastors and churches should be serving the poor. Let's look at, at another scripture. John 13 verses 14 to 15. It is not members who are supposed to be serving churches, pastors. It is not members who are supposed to be bringing to, to pastors to serve them. Look what Jesus said. John 13, 14 to 15. He says, If I then, being your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also, who are, you see, who are pastors? I am your Lord and Master. I am washing the feet of people who are lower than me. I am washing the feet of members. That is an example of a leader. As a leader, the leader, the pastor is supposed to be washing the feet. Not physically. Not feet washing ceremony that we are doing. But you are supposed to be serving. You are supposed to be going low to the level of, of, of your members. You are supposed to be going low to their level. You are supposed to be going low to take care of them. You are supposed to look into their feet their dirty feet and washing. You are supposed to look at their hungry mouth and feed it. You are supposed to look at their naked body and clothe them. You are supposed to stoop, stoop low. I stoop low as your Lord. If I am your Lord, if I am your Savior, if you are calling on to me, if you say I am the owner of the church, if I could go to stoop low to wash the feet of ordinary people who are even my, my followers, who are my members? What should you be doing to your members? This is God's expectation from pastors. Pastors are supposed to be doing the same thing. We are supposed to be stooping low to look at the needs and the condition that our people are living in to go and take care of them, wash their feet, not just physically washing feet like some people are doing ceremony, but to go and take care of their needs. Because it says here, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. A direct commandment. Go and stoop low to the level of your people. Go and stoop low to the level of your members and go and take care of them no matter how low they are and in whatsoever need they, are, they, might, they might be having. Let me show you another scripture. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is that it is not the poor and the disadvantaged, the widows, that are supposed to be going to finance the pastor. It is not the, you know, the poor, the destitute, and the, you know, the members who are supposed to be carrying the burden of the pastor. It is the pastor and the church that are supposed to be carrying the burden of ordinary members. Just like Jesus did here. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 14 to 18, I mean to 15, let's open 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 14 to 15. The scripture says, but by any equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want. You see, the abundance of the church, many churches today have abundance, but they are not supplying the want of their own members even. Many churches have abundance today, but they are not supplying the want of their own country, countrymen, of their own country women, of their own citizens. If the Bible says anybody that has, this is the purpose of wealth, and this is the purpose of power. This is the purpose of abundance. That the abundance should be used to supply the needs of those who don't have. That is exactly what the church in the book of Acts got right. They brought all the money. They sold their houses. They sold their properties, their land. And brought all the money. So that the money was distributed among the people that lacked. Among the people that didn't have anything. So he's saying... By all means, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply to, the, to, to their want. That their abundance may also be a supply to your want. 
that there may be equality, you see. God is always concerned about equality. God is always concerned about people's need being met. Not class, so that we don't have class in the church or in the society. So that the classes will be bridged and the, and the gap will be bridged and will be low and will be, will be reduced. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over and he that gathered little had no lack. So everybody's needs were met and everybody's needs is equally ministered to. So this is the, Christ, the Christianity. This is the Bible. This is what we are supposed to be preaching to people. That we, we gather money into the church. Money that comes to the church, to the pastor, is supposed to be used to take care of all the members of the church. And when the needs of the members of the church are met, it's supposed to create equality in the society. Can you imagine the kind of equality we could have in Nigeria if with this message has been preached? We are supposed to use our financial power, economic <coughs> power, political power, any kind of abundance that we, God has given to us to use it to provide for the needs of the needy. That is the whole sense of it. Not to just for some men of God to be getting richer and richer and to be building empires and you know their own kingdom while their members cannot even feed themselves. So the story of the uh, Zarephath woman is about abundance for her. It's about provision for her. Because at the end of the day, she was provided for more, much more than what she had before then and much more than what she could even dream of. She was provided for before she was, she didn't even have enough to eat the next day for herself and her son. But later on in that scripture, it says that her whole household was provided for. The whole household was provided for. So much abundance came. So it was the big deal here in this story was not Elijah. The big deal was not Elijah. The big deal was the woman that God loved, that God was caring for. God didn't just love their, uh, the servant, Elijah. God loved the woman too. And God actually wanted to bless the woman. That's why God sent the servant to her to meet a need. And for her to meet, and then God informed her ahead of time. God, God spoke to her that I'm sending this person to you so that you know that, you know, she is coming from me. And then you give what you have to feed her. And then I'm supplying everything. I'm paying the bill. This is what the Bible is supposed to be like, unlike the, the, the false doctrine that is circulating in the churches today. So, um, well, I, I have decided to start a movement. We Right now, we are calling it the movement against uh, deception in the church. The, woman, the movement against deception in the church. And, you know, because every, you know, I heard that the pastors and the men of God have gathered together and they are all you know, prohibiting their members from listening to me and from coming to hear my messages and from coming to my live broadcast because they are afraid the, the temples and the empires of these people are collapsing and they are going to the empires the false empires are going to collapse everywhere where they are preaching these false doctrines they are going to be empty we are going to preach until we preach them empty we are going to set the people of god free so we, uh, we, we, so I said, okay, if they are planning against me, if they are colliding and, uh, and you know, all of them are planning and banning people from coming, we must also organize ourselves. We must organize ourselves for the people. We must organize movement for people, for the people of God, movement, movement against deception in the church. So yesterday I, I announced it and I said, everybody that wants to participate in this movement for the sanctity of the church, for the purification of the church, if you really want to participate in this movement, I want to raise up, I want to have 300 ambassadors. Right yesterday, we had 80 people uh, register that they want to become ambassador for this cause. They want to spread this truth, this deliverance for the body of Christ. So if you want to be, be a, a part of it and you want to become a part of this movement for the, for the, for the, against this deception in the body of Christ, and for the purification of the of the of the church and uh, you know if you want to be a part of it and you didn't register yesterday please right now you know write some say i am in i am in just write something that i am i am part of it or i am in write something and say that you want to participate in this movement i agree or i am in or put your thumb up or you know that i am in i am in i am in it so 
write something. If, then we also want some other people who want to join the committee. We want to have a committee for people that want to be activists. You want to play an active role. You want to really uh, help us with ideas on how we could spread this word and send the people of God free. So if you want to be an activist, you have to write committee. Committee. So you want to join the committee. You, you, don't, you don't just want to you know, do instructions and be an ambassador where you are, but you want to actually contribute. You want to participate actively. Then you have to write a committee. Committee. Write committee if you want to participate actively. You want to contribute. But if you, if you just want to be an ambassador, then you just write, uh, I am in. I am in. I am in. I am in. So, uh, then I also noticed that a lot of you don't know that I have two live broadcasts back to back. I actually have two live broadcasts. Two hours before this one, I have one that finishes and immediately we start this one. So it's called Fruits of the Spirit or Book Review or something. But we have live broadcasts with me two times a day, back to back, two hours before each other. I mean, two hours interval between each other. So I finished one before this one. This is the second one now. But you have to, uh, you know, you can write uh, and uh, you don't need to write, but you can see the schedule. Uh, just the schedule is actually uh, British time, 5 p.m. and then 7 p.m. Nigerian time, 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. as well. Uh, European time is 6 p.m. and 8 p.m. And uh, in America, it is uh, 12 p.m. and 2 p.m. So there are two two uh, programs that I have every day. Today we had a wonderful program with Andrew Modolo from Zambia, who is a fruit of the kingdom, or uh, kingdom fruit. Wonderful testimony. I will encourage you guys to go get it, to go watch it. If you missed it, go. you can go find it on my on my YouTube, Sunday Adelaide official YouTube page. Uh, but, you know, let's register for this movement. Let the movement begin. Let the revolution start. Let us begin to gather ourselves, organize ourselves, and begin to spread the word to set the people of God free. Okay, guys, who of you want to share with us today? Please, come on. Come, come, come. Anybody who wants to share, if they want to share, let me know. Get up, get up, get up. Hello, everyone. Um, I, I just wanted to share when uh, Dr. Sunday, I was laughing, but I was really thinking about it. When Dr. Sunday was saying that the prophets and the pastors that uh, preach that the Lord says that you should do something, they're the same person that benefits from it. And it's just like a light bulb moment because, you know, the, the part of the Bible that Dr. Sunday was reading where it says that God put it in the person's heart. So there was a third party that was involved. It was God that was putting in the person's heart to do it. Not that it's the same person that is going to benefit that uh, also advise you to do something. I, I was just, I mean, I was laughing, but it, I felt like knocking my head how Dr. Sunday says, you know, the doer when he was uh, younger. It, you know, it's funny now, but it's just so, so, so much truth. How can the same person that tells you that God said you should do something is a person that is benefiting from it? And it's a person, and we are not even thinking that to tell the person that, why can't God directly tell you uh do it for you why does he have to tell somebody else to do it you know i used to think as a kid when i was watching african movies that all these um uh, abolists and all these people in this african movies how come that they had been giving helping people to make money and you know they can't actually help themselves to win the lottery or to do something and you know it's the same thing in the church how come these people can't help themselves with the money that they're asking us how come we have to be the one to give it to them? So, um, it's, you know, every day I'm learning something new. But these are just simple things that maybe we should um, use our critical thinking mind that we've developed now to, um, to help ourselves and to help other people, not just ourselves, other people around us. I think when we start having discourse about this with our friends and family, everybody's mind will be opening. We will be generating minds that understands that we need to think and not be afraid and we don't need anybody to be uh, the middleman between us and God.
because that's exactly what it is and it just really occurred to me i mean the, that is just exactly like the um people in these movies that they would say oh i'm going to this baba to help me with money and at the end of the day the baba is poor he always lives in a poor place and is wretched so i really don't understand that but in this case it's the reverse they're smarter the pastors that are doing this they're in suits and everything and they're telling you that god said we should do this or we should do that or we, you know i don't I, I don't want to run the risk of repeating myself but let's just all get this um i i don't want to say my own language let's just get this truth and digest them and make them work for us and also share them with our loved ones and please please don't forget the movement the movement is our voice is a way of getting to as many people as possible to get like-minded people together to see that our eyes have actually opened it's not one or two people in the church that are questioning themselves the people in the church that are silently saying this is wrong this is wrong but when they look around and see that there's so many people that they are agreeing with this there's so many people that are involved in this they just think okay let me just keep quiet maybe maybe there's something wrong with me but when they see you when they see one or two people objecting to it they would also get up because believe me i, I believe other people are thinking this way but they're just thinking that i'm thinking this way but there's so many people in these churches there's so many people around so it means that you know i'm the i'm the person that something is wrong with because that's how i used to think i used to look around in the church and think this is not right but many people are here and the pastor seems so kind and so calm you know but all this calm and kindness is actually what is ripping me off <laughs> but, <laughs> but i was i was deceived i was i was just stupid i wasn't thinking straight but now i'm thinking straight so let's just do it and um let's just uh stop all this abuse all this manipulation you know if we if we lend our voice to the truth and, we, uh, and our friends and family are saying that we are saying something against this they would also come up and say okay i was thinking this way i was thinking like this as well but i didn't really know what to say i didn't really know what to share it with so i appreciate your time i appreciate you all that already joined the movement so more people to join the movement that would be great thank you oh yeah to join the movement uh there is a movement there is already a page on facebook no, no, so now right now what you need to do first of all dr sunday is just reminding me that what we need to do first of all is that we need to write to show interest in either you want to be an ambassador by writing i am in to be an ambassador and to be a committee member you write committee the difference between an ambassador and a committee member is that a committee member is more involved and they make decision on the progress of the movement and what we're going to do they make decisions on it they help with planning and strategizing and the uh, ambassadors they will be in the various location we will be sending them information details they will be implementing, implementing. yes they will be implementing so we will send them what they need to implement so whatever the committee decides it will be sent to the ambassadors on how to implement them so you just take the action you take the um, physical action the talking we we'll all be ambassadors and committee at some point, but at the same time. yes, at the same time, I think committees will also be ambassadors, but ambassador can strictly be ambassadors if they wish to be. So that's it. I can't wait. I'm really looking forward to this movement. To yes. So who else wants to talk before I get up? I think Mrs. Sharon K is coming. So guys, uh, I'll see you again soon. Hello everybody, good to see you again on the platform. Well, obviously again, our mind is being shifted. <laughs> this time I am just so glad that scriptures have brought the truth and the light of this matter to our knowledge. And I, what I want to address due to time is the information that uh, some churches uh, are telling their members not to listen to this platform anymore and so on and so forth. So what I would just like to say for those who are still connected with people in their churches that such things are going on, they have your phone number, they're still calling you just just be courageous 
and tell them and, and enlighten them. Get these scriptures out ready. Enlighten them to compare what man is saying, what the leaders are saying, and compare with, with, with the Bible with actually what the word says. Because it is now our duty that we have heard, we, we have to tell people, we have to let them know. Doesn't, it doesn't have to be in, 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 in a bad way, but you need to enlighten your family, you need to enlighten your friends. We have the scriptures. Go on, go back to this page and look at comments that people are making. How people are just rejoicing that they are out of it, that they've seen the light. So if we've seen the light, let us share the light. We, we can rescue. I mean, it doesn't matter what they are telling them. We can still rescue people because people are still connected with us. So that's what I will ask us to do. If you're still connected with people in those churches that these kind of things are happening, I would say that it is our duty to educate them in love and understanding and share the light with them. And of course, I just really want to thank Pastor Sunday again for taking up this issue that I have not seen anybody be able to take up with the Word of God comparing to the things that we have been listening to and we have been hearing. So congratulations again. We have seen the light in this Did matter. Have you ever heard of that Zera Fat woman? No. You never heard of it? No, but I have yeah, heard of it. I've heard of many other scriptures that you've talked about as a way to get money. money yeah you know from from us yes thank you hello everyone good evening it's nice to have you on this platform once again i want to congratulate you uh, because we have been liberated endlessly we have been liberated thump up to everyone and also I want to uh, thank uh, our mentor who has, who has taken time to uh, explain this, this scripture that the Sarabat woman, it was on her base interest that God sent the prophet so that, she, so that God can sustain her and her family. And also, uh, and also, Every one of us, we have a duty to, to spread this message. You don't know who you could have saved. You don't know uh, somebody that you would have delivered from ignorance. You know, ignorance is, is, is one thing. And, and, and uh, ignorance is one thing. And another thing is somebody not having uh, the, the privilege, not having the, the right opportunity to, to listen to this to this light that has that has come instead of us bringing our money taking our money to the to the pastors the money would have been given to the poor man the money would have been given to a homeless man and in that children widows, yeah, widows children motherless motherless homes God would have been so happy and opening a lot of doors, opportunity, financial blessings to every one of us. Rather than giving it to pastors who are building their organization and their business empire. What I'm saying is, this, uh, is some churches, they, now they, they're having their, their microfinance bank. They're using pe pe the money that people were sowing seed to them. They are using the same money to give people as as loan. They they they, they charge interest <laughs> on top of it. Even these people are their members, so <laughs> can you imagine? So the very money that they the, the very money that they that they obtain from us, <laughs> our our tithe, our offering, is the same money that they are giving back to us. Take this and give us on interest. Yes, like micro finance bank is in the church. <laughs> first, first of all, you are in Ukraine. Eh? But, <laughs> I was born and brought up in church, eh? so I, I know everything. So, I really thank God that the pastor has really opened our eyes. And one other thing is that uh, if we follow the ways of our fathers, we would, we, we would have the same results. 
that our 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 parents our fathers received but if we turn a new if you follow a new way another approach we will receive a greater reward and blessings from god because the act of giving is 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 charity to god the bible says that he that giveth to poor you lend to god you are you are giving god money and ask god when i am in need pay me back this money that is when you give to the poor and notice that god exalted arms giving more than tithe and offering more than profit money so every one of us time is up for all this for all those scammers who are calling themselves pastor they they, they appear bishops uh whatever i want to tell you there is no bishop there is no pope there is no pastor that is higher than you yes the they, every one of us are the same you carry the same spirit of god the same spirit of god is in every man the same spirit of god is in every woman so don't allow anybody to intimidate you. Don't be intimidated by every of their noise they are, that they are making. Do the right thing. Follow your heart. Don't allow anyone to manipulate you. Enough is enough. <laughs> enough is enough. Yeah. Christ said in the Bible, he, 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 he said that a time will come that they won't, they won't rip us they will not rip us, uh, steal, steal from us any longer. So now is the time. So I, once again, I want to con congratulate you because this is the time that every one of us have been free. And mind you, the movement of God always started a movement with one person. So we are more than one person. We are going to, we are going to change Nigeria. We are going to liberate Africa with this message. So. I want to thank you. Thank you for this uh, privilege, and I celebrate you. Thank you. Tomorrow, I'm going to be talking. I'm going to be speaking on. Tomorrow, I'm going to be speaking on. Second Chronicles 2020. Are you yes. Second Chronicles 2020, which is. <laughs> You will probably know it by now. Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. <laughs> Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. So I'm going to speak on that tomorrow. So uh, the topic for tomorrow is uh, is prophet offering. Is prophet offering scriptural according to Second Chronicles twenty twenty is sec is uh, is is prophet offering scriptural is it biblical is prophet offering biblical according to Second Chronicles twenty twenty according to Second Chronicles twenty twenty is that scriptural so we want to examine that tomorrow. Is it scriptural to be telling people to bring prophet offering? Be, no, when they said give, no, believe in your with the prophet, and you shall uh, and you shall prosper or whatever they're saying. So we are going to de deliver uh, the message on that one tomorrow. Is the prophet offering? Uh, believe in the prophet and you shall prosper. How scriptural is that? How scriptural is prophet offering? So if you have not yet registered for the ambassador or committee, please go ahead and write that you are in. If you are an ambassador, if you have committee, just write committee. And if you have not yet uh, shared the message, Please go ahead and share the message. Uh, go and look for the share button. Let's quickly share the message and let the world go around. Let's set the world free. Thank you so much for your time and have a wonderful evening. Blessings. <laughs>